So stress is largely determined by your perception, as I said, and as individuals, humans these days, we have the ability to control what we perceive as stressful. With different genetics and lifestyle habits, as it says there, we are geared to perceive and tolerate stress differently. Okay? Like we all know someone who works around the clock and, you know, does so much for their job but never seems to be stressed out. Like it's just always happy, uh, always, you know, has time to talk to people, things like that, even though they're spending like hours and hours doing work. And you might think that, oh, what they're doing is so stressful. But for them, like, it's not as stressful as it may have been when they first started because they've become habituated to it. Okay, like I'm sure if you know, some, of pe some of you people would have stepped into that role, you'd be really, really stressed. But for that person, it's not that stressful anymore because it's their thing. Okay, but if they stepped into your daily life and faced some of the things that you faced in life, like kids, um, relationships, things, things like that, they'd be stressed. Okay, is this making sense to everyone? And an example that I had, it's always the traffic example because traffic is something that we just can't control but it's one of the like kickstarters of a cascade of like stressful events. Like after you get stuck in traffic, after work, you get home, you're probably angry, worked up, okay, things like that. But you can choose to react this way and exhibit a very large stress response, or you can choose to be a little more relaxed about it, possibly, <laughs> possibly show some frustration. But if we were thinking about that stress response as a big red circle, again, it'd be a big circle here, small circle there. Okay? Are you guys with me? Yes. So who in this room gets worked up about traffic? <laughs> Everyone. Let's go. I, I still do it, but I try to control to the best of my abilities because I've learned from my mistakes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So any questions about what I've been through so far? No? Okay. So you guys should now have a better understanding of what stress is. It should be a little different to what you initially wrote on the notepad. So now I'm going to talk about the physiology behind stress. And I'm going to do my absolute best to make it sound as simple as possible. So, stress response. When you perceive a certain event as stressful, the nervous system releases signals that protect from the stressor. Remember, that's the main goal of the stress response. And we stimulate the production of certain hormones neurotransmitters, which um, Samaya might talk about later. But really, this is what's happening. We're perceiving stress. Well, our brain is perceiving stress. It all starts at the central nervous system. What is the central nervous system? Anyone know? So, the central nervous system is like the director of the body. Talk about the brain and the spinal cord. When you're training in the gym and you go to do a bicep curl, it's not your muscle that kind of initiates that initial movement. It's your brain, your spinal cord, sending those signals out to the muscle, telling it to you know, do the elbow flexion or whatever you're telling it to do. Okay, so the nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord perceive the stress, stressor as stressful. And then we get the release of certain hormones and things like that, which we'll talk about soon. This thing here, that's a kidney. That's a little gland sitting on the kidney. It's called the adrenal gland. Okay, this releases certain hormones. Shave your leg. It's a presentation. Mum always shaves his legs for a presentation. Every time. <laughs> so that's that's a very simplified manner. What is happening when the body perceives stress? So as I said, we've got the central nervous system, which is then like divided up into different components. Okay, what we're mainly concerned about today is what is going on here. Okay, so we call this the autonomic nervous system. It controls involuntary actions. Okay, and the two components that we're primarily concerned about, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. Okay, so we all know what nervous system is now. Yep, okay, brain, spinal cord. These are the peripheral nervous system refers to all the nerves that kind of run out of the spine. Okay, and then we'll talk about these right now. So we've got two different um, nervous systems that can be stimulated throughout the day. Parasympathetic, sympathetic. Has anyone ever heard about these two? No. Okay, so this should be all new information. So again, 
should be different, a lot different to what you guys you know, noted down in your notepad before we started today. So when this division or component of the nervous system gets stimulated, so this is what the body exhibits, okay? So pupils get constricted, kind of get smaller. Salivation is stimulated. Heart rate is slowed down. Stimulates digestion. Stimulates secretion of digestive enzymes. Okay. Um, and when the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, we get this. Okay, so dilates pupils, get bigger, increased focus, inhibits salivation, accelerates heartbeat, okay, digestion gets inhibit, inhibited, we get adrenaline release, and body temperature goes up. When our body perceives something as stressful, which one do you think gets stimulated? Yeah. 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 So a good example is like when I tell Yoshi, one of my clients who's sitting up the back there, to deadlift 160 kilos, as soon as that word comes out of my mouth, his eyes light up, he starts sweating, like he starts getting worked up, his, I can see his heart like pulsing like through his chest, like he's exhibiting a stress response. Okay, his body is getting him ready to lift 160 kilos. Okay, now sympathetic generally means, you know, sympathy, and this, um, in the context of stress and whatnot, sympathetic refers to the exact opposite, opposite of sympathetic. Okay, this is not very, it's not actually a, a sympathetic response. It's like, you know, this is not sympathetic. Okay, heart rate, you know, going through the roof. Okay, that's not what we generally associate with sympathy. So it's just called sympathetic nervous system, okay? So we have a stress response, and then we have a relaxation response, okay? And throughout the day, the body is always trying to maintain a balance between the two to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis, does anyone know what that refers to? It's a comfortable zone for your body. Your body doesn't want to be too stressed out, but then your body also doesn't want to exhibit no stress response at all, okay? Because there are benefits to the stress response. It keeps us alive at the end of the day when we face certain scenarios. So there's always a balance between the two, okay? So just to recap, whenever, you're, whenever you perceive something as stressful, this is what is being stimulated, okay? All these things are happening, okay? Do you think when, when, you know, when you're going, when you're, we think back to cavemen days, when the cavemen were running away from, you know, certain animals, things like that, do you think the body was worried about um, salvation or digestion okay it stops digestion you know what it does it it shunts blood to the muscles that are working to the legs so the druid can run faster okay it's protecting you from the stressor in the case of the you know 160 kilo deadlift same sort of thing there okay and you know why you tend to like throw up if you eat food uh, before you train it's because when you train that's a stress on the body and digestion is inhibited so if there's still food going on, you know, in the, in the uh, small intestines and whatnot, then you're going to get the feeling of throwing up because there's no blood in there to help with digestion. All the blood is going to the working muscles. Okay, and then, you know, that's why you get that, that reflux feeling. Okay, because digestion is being inhibited by the sympathetic nervous system when you train. Okay? Any questions about that so far? When you, um, people talk about CNS fatigue all the time. Yep. Um, why are they talking about that? So you, it, you need a lot to do that with you. Yeah, so yeah. remember CNS being the actual brain and the spinal cord. Generally, yeah. when you're lifting really like heavy loads, like in the gym, yeah. like obviously it's a nervous system that's signaling all the muscles to go, yeah. and it can get slightly fatigued. So it's just the, the down regulation of those systems, yep. um, which can reduce like force output, things like that. It's only very temporary, so it actually doesn't last that long. No. So a lot of people like to say that you know their CNS is wrecked after a session and it lasts for like three days and stuff like that. But generally, you know, after the session, you're all good to go again. Yeah. Okay. So is that more of a um, more of an overuse? of the nervous system yeah. rather than... Yeah. Like, think about it, lifting a one RM off the ground, yeah. that's going to be maximally recruiting the nervous system, like, 
as much as possible, yeah? yeah. So it's going to be fairly fatiguing on the brain, on the spinal cord, things like that. Yeah. Which means, which is why, like, after you do a one RM, you struggle doing other exercises because yeah. you're kind of fatigued. But then yeah. afterwards, you're all good to go. Yeah. yeah okay. Sense, yeah. Cool. So, the stress balance, which is what I was talking about before, your body is constantly going through this balance, yeah? Trying to keep you at homeostasis, at comfortable, comfortably comfortable zone. So when we exhibit the sympathetic response, the anecdote to that is a parasympathetic response. This parasympathetic nervous system, you know, we call it the rest and digest system. Okay, it allows things to just slow down. It allows your body to recover from the stress that it's just faced. And the way we activate this is by relaxing, just being chill, okay, sleep, things like that. I've already mentioned this. So frequent or chronic activation of the sympathetic nervous system can lead to many problems. Okay, so if you are chronically stressed, elevated blood pressure, digestive problems, immune system suppression, okay? So your body will try its best to maintain homeostasis. Okay, it will always fight to maintain homeostasis, always. But sometimes, you know what, you need to help it by just relaxing, having some time to yourself. And that's a big one these days. People, just very, you know, we tend to be very selfless, which is good in a way, but we also need to be worrying about ourselves. Okay, and if the sympathetic division of your nervous system is elevated throughout the day, all the time, okay, you're probably sleep deprived as well, and it's going up even more. Well, you don't ever give your parasympathetic division a chance to kind of be the anecdote for the SNS, okay? And even though it's trying its best to absolutely do so, if you're perceiving everything, you know, in your life as stressful, which I'm saying you do, but lots of people tend to be very stressed about things, as I said, that aren't actually stressful. We think about what humans have faced throughout evolution, and that's what we call true stress. Um, then yeah, your, your sympathetic division will dominate. And that has potential drawbacks when the goal is body composition. Okay? So, what have you learned so far? Let's go. Anyone? Just one like point. Lisa, what do you learn? Give me something. Hang your What is it? The, when your body... Um, it's comfortable. It's comfortable zone. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Correct. If there's one thing I want you guys to take away from today, it's that. Anything else? Robbie? What did you learn, mate? Um, just two, two different Yes. Yeah. Two different uh, components of the nervous system that can be affected during stress. Cool. Okay. So we're learning a few things, which is good. Now, cortisol. Who's heard of cortisol? Hands up. Okay. So let's go. What do we know about cortisol? Wakes you up in the morning. It's a good one. What else? Cortisol. A little bit more than too much as that. Yeah, it's a good one. Hormone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So cortisol is a stress hormone. That's generally what you know people um, see cortisol as. It is a stress hormone. It responds to stress. Um, <laughs> Some people like to say that cortisol like what leads to fat gain and stuff like that. I'd be a little skeptical if I heard anyone say that. Okay, there is some type of relationship between cortisol and fat gain, especially in the midsection. But at the end of the day, you know, calorie in versus calories out is also going to determine that. So it's not only cortisol that is influencing, you know, fat gain. Okay, we've got to think broadly about these things. It's never actually just one. Um, thing that's you know leading to fat gain. There's generally a few different uh, components. Okay, so cortisol, as um, Dale said, will helps wake you up, and that is, is its main function. Okay, so cortisol is a main stress hormone, which gets released when our body um, faces a stressor or a potential stressor. Okay, but it generally only only get re gets released when the stressor is quite severe. Okay, so for example, if you drop a glass of milk, cortisol would probably not get released, okay? Because it's not the only stress hormone, 
remember I said uh, previously that adrenaline gets released when your body sees something as stressful? Adrenaline is more of an acute response to stress. Okay, cortisol, more of a severe, long-term, <coughs> chronic response to stress, okay? And cortisol's not all that bad, okay? It helps wake you up. So it kind of goes up in the morning. So let's say that was 6 a.m. And when it goes up, your blood pressure goes up, heart rate increases slightly, you know, you become more aroused, focus increases, and you end up waking up, okay? Now, this is largely also determined, so it doesn't always go up at 6 a.m., generally determined by you know, your daily habits and your wake to sleep cycle, okay? But if you are always waking up and going to sleep at different times, then what happens here is this you know, cortisol, your body doesn't actually know when it should be releasing cortisol. Okay, so I'm sure some of us have had problems uh, with waking up a bit too early, like maybe waking up in the middle of the night. I generally hear that from some clients and not being able to sleep. Okay, that is in large part due to cortisol. So it goes up and it decreases throughout the day. So, and it decreases it throughout the day to help us go to sleep. Okay, now p people who are chronically stressed from work and things like that, what ha ends up happening is that their cortisol levels don't actually drop throughout the day. You know what happens? They stay elevated. Okay, so they're going to bed, that might be 9 p.m., and cortisol is still up, they can't go to sleep. And who has had trouble going to sleep? Everyone, and that's in large part due to cortisol. Okay, and the more stressed you are, okay, the more this is gonna be, the effects of cortisol are gonna be pronounced. Okay, has anyone uh, ever faced, um, like waking up like at 3 a.m. or something like that, not being able to go to sleep? Okay, so what do you guys think is happening here? So, let's say that's 3 a.m. Cortisol is going up way too early. Okay, so as I said, it regulates your wake to sleep cycle. And the more inconsistent your wake to sleep cycle is, the more inconsistent cortisol is going to be. And that is why James is going to be talking about later having a regular wake to sleep cycle is super important if you want to mitigate the effects of stress. Okay, shift workers. Okay, always up and down with their shift work. Cortisol, we're gonna be looking something like this, the, you know, the cortisol release. Okay, so we just gotta keep, they take these things into account. Okay, so again, cortisol does respond to stress, so that it is a stress response, but also responds to your wake, wake and sleep cycle. Okay, which a lot of people tend to forget when we're talking about cortisol. Okay, does that, does that make sense to everyone? So when, you know, if someone tells you that they're having trouble sleeping, waking up middle of the night, can't go back to sleep, or tell them that they need to probably wind down a little more before they go to bed, okay, instead of doing all this, you know, rushing to finish a work project right before they sleep, and cortisol is what's helping you stay focused during that period of time. Okay, it's providing energy, it's breaking down nutrients in your body to provide energy for your focus, it's keeping you awake, heart rate up, and it never gets the opportunity to go down. And then you might, you know, you might try and go to sleep at 10 o'clock, but you don't sleep till 12 a.m. That's because cortisol is then slowly declining. And when it's finally had enough, it reduces, and then you go to sleep. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So cortisol, yes, stress hormone, it also regulates your wake to sleep cycle, helps provide you with energy throughout the day, actually helps with immune function too, Okay, so there's some positives and some benefits to cortisol, okay? So how do you feel about that training in the evening, for example, is that you know, conducive yeah, well, to it could, yeah, it's No, it's not conducive to going to so sleep. Um, you know, you'd probably... Yeah, if, okay, so if it's a regular pattern, then okay. that'd be totally cool, because remember, your wake to sleep cycle starts to adjust. Okay, so we would eventually adjust to that, and it's a regular thing, right? So regularity, as I said before, is super important um, when trying to mitigate the effects of stress. Okay, all good? Sweet, so do you guys now know more about cortisol than you previously did? Okay, so stress hormone helps wake you up, helps put you to bed. Okay, there are negatives, there are positives too. 
Remember, the poison is always in the dose, yeah, with something like that. Too much cortisol, not so good. Too little cortisol, not so good. Okay. When you're dieting, generally you're more uh, prone to releasing cortisol as well. Okay. So, so we talked about the physiology of stress. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the effects that stress actually has on the body during training and things like that. So, stress isn't all that bad. Okay, so I've been you know, talking about all the negatives, but there are positives. So when you train in the gym, you are actually putting a stress on your body. Specifically, a stress on, the, on your muscles. Contractile proteins within the muscle, they're being stressed out. Okay, they're being you know, torn apart, things like that, when you're training. It's a stress on the body, but remember, your body gets stronger, becomes more resilient, so your muscles grow bigger. Okay, so that is a good type of stress. Same with inflammation, like a lot of people like to say, inflammation is really bad, and things like that. Well, you know, when you train, inflammation goes up locally in specific muscles. Now, uh, it could go up systemically depending on how hard you're training. Okay, but then your body responds to that inflammation by reducing it, adapting to it, becoming more resilient. Okay, so in that sense, inflammation is actually a good thing from training. Okay, now, these are some things that can occur when you are highly stressed and can limit your ability to train and grow muscle. Okay, so I'm sure everyone in here wants to grow muscle because that's going to help body composition. Okay, remember when we are trying to change our body composition, we're not worried about weight loss. Well, I'm not worried about weight loss. I'm worried about fat loss and muscle growth. Okay, because you lose, you could lose 10 kilos and not look, 10 kilos of, you know, five could be muscle, five could just be, three could be fat, two could be water, you wouldn't really look any better, okay? You'd probably look, honestly, worse than where you started. Okay, if you want to look better and change your body composition, be healthier as well, because remember, we're not only worried about looks here, the more muscle you have, to an extent, the healthier you're probably going to be, okay? Resistance training is great for things like that, not just talking about, you know, body composition and the way you look, there's other benefits. But, yeah, high life stress may lessen a person's ability to adapt to weight training. Okay, so remember, when we train with weights, the muscle doesn't, doesn't just grow just like that. Your body needs to first recover and adapt to that stress. Okay, this is why if you're training too much, you're not gonna get, you know, you could probably be getting better results. If you train too much, your body may not be able to recover to that training and won't adapt. So, there was a study, 12-week study, where they found psychological stress. And that's another thing that I didn't mention. Stress can come, stress can be emotional, can be psychological, can be anything. There's many, you know, wide variety of components that come into stress. Okay, but psychological stress specifically reduced strength gains in a 12-week study. Okay, so again, you know, if you're chronically stressed, you can't expect to be you know, performing to the best of your abilities, you might have to adjust your expectations. The difference between high and low stress makes a twofold difference in the rate of recovery. Okay, so remember I said if your body is not recovering from the training, it's not going to grow. And if you're highly stressed, well, you're most likely not going to recover because high stress cuts recovery capacity in half. Okay. Now, obviously, like, what is high stress? Well. You don't know what high stress actually is, it's different for everyone, but in this study, they found that the people who were highly stressed had their recovery capacity cut in half. And the risk of injury is also roughly doubled when you're highly stressed, okay? And this, they found this in uh, football athletes in the NFL in America, when they were going, college athletes, so they were obviously going through school, when they had high periods of academic stress during exams and stuff like that, they, they might, lots of them got injured, okay? So some of the reasons why sometimes um, it is so important to just think about managing your stress before you worry too much about tracking your macros and all these other semantics when it comes to training and nutrition, okay? Stress and its impact on nutrition and eating behavior. Okay, so now we're getting a little more um, uh, focused on like nutrition. So 
acute stress in, in research is related to a decrease in appetite. Okay, so, you know, like we, we talk to people who are stressed out. Some people say that stress reduces their appetite. Is, would you guys agree with that? Some people say they gain weight being stressed. Is that right? You hear like varying like opinions on it. Okay, generally, the case is that acute stress reduces appetite, chronic stress increases it. But in saying that, I have found, I have found generally this is the case, but there have also been people who exhibit opposite responses. Very, uh, lots of inter-individual variability, but for the most part, this is how it goes, yeah? When you're acutely stressed at work, do you get hungry? No, you know, some people forget to eat throughout the day, which isn't necessarily a good thing, doesn't matter if your goal is fat loss, not eating is not necessarily a good thing. And chronic stress in studies was associated with an increase in appetite. Okay, and it pushes the people to self-medicate on what we call comfort food, comfort eating. Okay, and you know, what is the thing that you go for when you're, when you're looking for comfort food, comfort eating? Carbs. Okay, they found in this study people just wanted to eat carbs. You know what? There's a reason behind that. Carbs actually, they're therapeutic on the body. They store energy, and they can actually reduce cortisol to some degree. Okay, so there's a reason why your body goes for carbs. And that is why I don't like my clients beating themselves down um, and you know, when they overeat or thing, and things like that. Like, you need to understand that when you start a dieting phase, the chances of you overeating are probably pretty high. We've all done it before. Okay, and it's, it's not because, you know, you're weak or anything like that, it's your body pushing you to do something. And the reason your body does that is because of the pleasure principle. So our bodies just are naturally seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Okay, so it's your brain. Remember I said, when you're losing fat, your body fat is decreasing. Your fat cells tell your brain to eat more food. It's not necessarily like it is sometimes, I guess, you. But it all starts, it stems from the fact you're actually losing body fat, okay? And you can feel stressed after like kind of binging <laughs> after you're like, yeah, and then after and then after you binge, you feel even more stressed, and it's just like a snowball effect. Okay, so yeah, food temporarily inhibits stress response as it stimulates the parasympathetic division of your nervous system. Okay, that is part of the reason why we go for carbs. Okay, and if anyone's not, maybe not sure, but Sometimes when you're dieting and you eat carbs, you find that the next day your weight goes down. Yeah. That's generally because it reduces cortisol to a certain degree. Cortisol sometimes stimulates water retention, even though there's a whole host of other hormones that play a part in what I'm talking about here. But on a very simplified level, it's because you're not as stressed when you eat carbs. Okay? Is that why you do uh, refeed? Yeah, definitely like part of the reason why. Okay? So, this is an interesting one. This study found that one stressful life event can reduce the thermic effect you experience with a meal quite significantly. So they fed these people, uh, they, they stressed them out, can't remember what it was, but they did something to stress them out. Remember, a stress response can be anything from getting scared to, as I said, dropping a glass of milk, it could be anything, right? They stressed a group of people out, they gave them a 900 calorie meal, and they found that the thermic effect, which is the amount of energy that your body burns while it is digesting that food, it reduced by 100 calories. So let's, let's like zoom out for a bit. Imagine you got stressed out after each meal that you had during your day. Your energy expenditure might end up reducing by you know, 300 calories, like just an arbitrary term there, arbitrary number, but you guys get the point? Okay, and imagine stressful life events just accumulating on a day-to-day -day basis your energy expenditure could take a significant hit, okay? And during these periods of time, they found cortisol was going up, you know, fat burning, fat oxidation in the body was being impaired, things like that, okay? This is something super important to take into account. When you're dieting, you need to stimulate the parasympathetic division of your nervous system by arresting, like, just making sure you keep stress at bay. Okay, and we're gonna talk about how soon.